as you know, uh, we are going to talk about uh, menopausal bone health. And uh, it has got a tremendous uh, impact on the you know, health of the person involved and as well as the family and to the society at large. And this, uh, uh, this bone health is affected with age in both males and females, but is uh, particularly more severely involved after the menopause in females. So the topic of uh, menopausal bone health assumes great importance from that point of view. So uh, we will talk about the impact it has on the bone health of the menopausal woman. And next, uh, we are going to learn how to prevent osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is something which happens with age, but uh, with certain measures and uh, lifestyle modifications, we can prevent it to a certain extent. And uh, then we have to learn about evaluation of bone health and osteoporosis. It's important to evaluate whether osteoporosis is already setting in and whether the person has got adequate bone health to tide over the years after the menopause and whether to stay healthy and fit in the postmenopausal years as far as bone health is concerned. And finally, we would learn about the management of osteoporosis and the consequences it has on the overall health of the person. So now uh, coming to the introduction, osteoporosis is something we uh, have been hearing for a long time. Uh, not only the medical persons, but even the lay people know about it. They know these two terms, osteopenia and osteoporosis. They know that osteoporosis means porous bones. Actually, it means porous bones or bones which have become fragile. And as the bones become fragile, they become very vulnerable to fracture or injury to very trivial injuries or trivial falls. In fact, it is so severe at times that even the person, you know, if the person tries to bend over, there may be a fracture. Or if, even if there is a severe bout of cough, there may be a fracture if the osteoporosis is so severe. So obviously, we have to take care that osteoporosis doesn't develop to that extent in the first place. And then if it at all develops, we have to address it at the right time with the right measures. Osteoporosis and fragility fractures are well known. Uh, before the age of menopause, you know, the bone has a certain strength and the peak bone mass, which is reached in any person is at 30 years of age. So there is something called a bone bank you know, like you have, you know, uh, your financial banks where you store money. A bone bank is something which you start depositing, you know, your nutrients or your elements in the bone right from young age. And at the age of 30, you reach your maximum deposit. After that, you have to live with it for the rest of your life. And then, you know, uh, gradually bone you know, resorption takes place over the years and the bones become gradually softer and softer. But you can halt the process by various means. And uh, for that, you have to be aware of the problem. Fragility fractures can happen not only in vulnerable places like spine and the hip. These are the two most vulnerable places where fractures take place due to osteoporosis. Hip fracture, femoral neck fracture, and vertebral column, and also the wrist. So these are the three areas where fractures commonly take place with trivial falls in this particular age group. Now the size of the problem. Now, as we know, the age of uh, menopause is around 50 years, between 45 and 55 years, with various uh, you know variations in different ethnic groups and countries. But overall, Nowadays, because of rising longevity, women spend uh, about uh, one third of their lives beyond the menopause, or even more, more than that. So a considerable number of years are spent in the post-menopausal age group. And in this age group, the bones become brittle, they become fragile, and there are you know, so many incidences where you have, uh, even in your own family, we see, we have women who are in this particular age group 
and we have to take care of them. We, we should make them aware that, you know, after a certain age, you have to take care of your bones and you, we should be attuned to preventing falls. And even, even if falls take place, then we have to give them proper medication and address the problem so that further weakening of bones doesn't take place. So the magnitude of the problem is such that about 10% of uh, women beyond the menopause do have fragility fractures all over the world. And this is of great public health importance because this is a great economic burden, not only on the family, the person, the family, but to the society at large. And uh, the society has to pay for it. The person has to pay for it. The family has to pay for it, not only in terms of money, but in terms of overall health conditions. Because once a person has uh, you know, a fragility fracture, then there is, uh, you know, the person goes into a downward spiral. Fragility fracture leads to, uh, Dr. Lavani, can we move to the previous slide, please? Yeah, uh, so the public health importance I was talking about is, uh, you know, uh, when a person sustains a fragility fracture, the person enters into a downward spiral. Fragility fracture, long-term immobility, and attendant comorbidities that goes on and the patient or the person enters a spiral from where it becomes very difficult to come out. So it has to be prevented at the first place. And then we move on. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we will find that uh, you know, there is a concept of bone metabolism through life. Bone is a living structure. You know, contrary to you know uh, some people's perception that bone is uh, not really as lively as other bodily parts, it is a very very dynamic structure. Throughout life, the bone gets formed and remodeled. Although after the age of thirty, there is more resorption than formation, but this is metabolism which goes on on throughout life. And so the initial years of life, if well spent with proper nutrition and exercise and active lifestyle, the bone mass can be built up properly so that you know, one can tie through the rest of the years of life. Climacteric and menopause, the word climacteric means, you know, actually the literal meaning is the rungs of a ladder. Like, you know, you keep moving from one phase of life to another. So the climacteric is a time period so of about five years when the menopause takes place or the changes associated with menopause in terms of hormonal changes which take place. That is a climacteric. And the menopause is a distinct point at which menopause takes place, which is one year from the last menstrual period. That's menopause. But climacteric is a big duration of time, say about five years which extends before and after the menopause. Bone metabolism after menopause assumes such a character that there is much more resorption than bone formation. Normally, you have uh, osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are responsible for forming new bone and osteoclasts, they carry out resorption. As you know, there are ossification centers in the bone. Right from fetal life, you have ossification centers which allow you to you know, uh, develop bones right from childhood to adulthood. But there is a you know, interplay between osteoblasts and osteoclasts throughout. And after the age of 30, the osteoclasts become more predominant so that bone loss becomes more predominant than bone formation. And it is in these later years of life that one has to be more careful. And the tune of this is set in the early years of life. So one has to make uh, the population aware that the, you know, that the evils of uh, menopausal osteoporosis are actually, you know, being formed right from adult, you know, early adult life. Uh, the seeds are sown there itself. 
So if the early adult life is properly taken care of in terms of bone health, uh, the problem of osteoporosis will be less severe. Uh, these two terms, osteoporosis and osteopenia. Osteopenia actually means low bone mass and osteoporosis means porous or soft bones. It, it doesn't mean that uh, osteopenia is not osteoporosis. Osteopenia, just that the mass is less and it's gradually progressing towards osteoporosis. So that's how we move on to the next one. Uh, normal physiology, as I've already said, the bone remodeling takes place throughout life. There are so many uh, hormones involved in bone formation, and not only you know, the parathyroid hormones, but also thyroid hormone and cortisol also has a, a role to play. It sometimes has a deleterious effect. Excess of cortisol can cause you know, osteoporosis and osteopenia. And uh, these uh, osteoclasts and osteoblasts also have uh, so many cytokines and uh, uh, you know, molecular level, at the molecular level, there are substances called rankle, which is the uh, ligands, receptor activator, NK ligands are there, which help the osteoclasts to break down bone or to cause resorption. And uh, we have made use of this by introducing substances like denosumab, which is a rankle inhibitor, which causes suppression of the osteoclast activity. And uh, after a fracture, after a fracture takes place, then you have to uh, be careful that the bone formation goes back to normal soon and the fracture unites properly without any neurological damage. Because these, you know, uh, vertebral fractures are very prone to cause neurological damage because of the spinal cord and the nerves which emanate from the foramina in that region. So a spinal fracture is even more dangerous because a person might develop paraplegia, incontinence, and so many other neurological problems unless the you know, problem of osteoporosis is dealt with properly. So we have a huge problem at hand for which, if we are properly aware, we can take proper care. Uh, so moving on. This is a paper, uh, Primary Osteoporosis in Postmenopausal Women. It was uh, published in uh, Chronic Diseases Translational Medicine in the year 2015. And what they've said is something which we all already know actually. With the average lifespan extended to 70 years, the normal age of longevity is about 70 years, as most women will spend more than one third of their life beyond the menopausal transition. Besides, the proportion of uh, such women is rising since the aging population is expanding rapidly. Thus, the health of menopausal women becomes a prime concern worldwide. This is just to re-emphasize the fact that postmenopausal women have got such an important risk of osteoporosis, which poses a risk not only for the family, but to the entire society as a ripple effect. Next, please. Uh, this is another paper, structural and metabolic changes in bone. And uh, uh, what they have said is, contrary to commonly held misconceptions, bone is a relatively dynamic organ that undergoes significant turnover compared to other organs in the body. Bone metabolism is a dynamic process that involves simultaneous bone formation and desorption controlled by numerous factors. And uh, the key actions which take place determine the skeletal mass, the structure, and the quality which are accrued and maintained throughout life. And the anabolic and catabolic actions are mostly balanced. Anabolic means bone formation and catabolic means bone resorption due to the tight regulation of the activity of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So as we move to the next slide, we see that this is a great concern for health economics. 
that is a cost burden on patients. A patient of a woman beyond the age of menopause who has a fragility fracture. If it's a femoral fracture, she's bedridden for a long time and may become immobile if proper care is not taken, is, is, is not given to her. And vertebral fractures can cause a lot of neurological problems. And there's always the risk of repeat falls. A person who has fallen and you know, has sustained a fracture, you know, there is sometimes an incidence of recurrent falls. So as I've already said, this person enters a spiral from which it becomes difficult to come out. And this is a financial burden for the patient and the family. And, uh, you know, since uh, many societies have got insurance, you know, cover for, uh, you know, everyone, people who enjoy free healthcare in some countries, the, the burden goes indirectly to the society and the state, which again, you know, derives its funds from the public at large. So it goes full circle. So the final burden falls on the society at large.